Good morning. Um, my topic is impacts in the early Earth. I'm not an astronomer. I'm a geoscientist at the University of Vienna, and I study impact craters, processes, and products. Now, the Earth, of course, has been subjected to uh, a lot of impacts uh, during its history, and if we only want to know how many, then we only need to look uh, to the Moon, for example, which is covered by impact craters, and all other uh, terrestrial planets that have uh, solid surfaces show our impact record as well. On Earth, however, a lot of active geological processes relatively rapidly obliterate the cratering record, which makes it difficult to recognize craters on Earth, and also because of the limited exposure of older rocks, uh, they disappear quite quickly from the record. So, so far, about 190 impact craters have been recognized on the Earth's surface. Among those iconic craters, like this one that many of you will know, the Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is a relatively small and young crater, only about 50,000 years old, and uh, diameter of a little over a kilometer, which was made by about a 50 meter diameter iron meteorite. Uh, just to illustrate what happens to impact crater, I'll show you the next one here. This is a similar size crater, almost exactly the same size crater in South Africa, uh, which is only five times as old, 250,000 years in geological time scales. That's absolutely nothing. And it's already difficult to recognize the crater rim, which is up here. And the whole crater interior is filled by uh, later sediments, making it impossible to detect any impact-derived rocks on the surface. It required drilling uh, to find impact-related rocks. And as they get older, here's another example, this one from Australia, um, they become more and more difficult to identify. This one is, again, in terms of time scales that we want to talk about here, Archean rocks and so on, very young, 145 million years old, and uh, most people will probably think that this kind of circular structure here is the remnant of the impact crater. Now this is the remnant of the central uplift that is eroded and collapsed. And the original crater is marked by this outer ring, uh, which is just a discoloration, a change in the fracture pattern of the background rocks. This is a crater that originally was 22 kilometers in diameter, as I said, only 145 million years old. Now, how do we recognize impact craters in general or impact-derived products? Well, normally we look for uh, shock metamorphic effects, and of those, the most prominent one is shocked quartz. Shock quartz has been found with basically any impact structure that we have identified so far, uh, almost any impact structure we've identified so far, and is one of the most characteristic uh, appearances. Other minerals are shocked as well, shocked zircons, shocked apatite, shocked plagioclase, shocked feldspar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But those are the best known ones. And you, you may uh, have heard of the case of the dinosaur killing Cretaceous tertiary boundary impact structure 66 million years ago. This was identified primarily on the basis of impact ejecta, geochemical signatures, and shock metamorphic signatures. So this would be characteristic. The problem is these rocks erode as well and uh, may not be present in the uh, Earth history. Now, another method to identify impact craters is by their geochemical signatures of the impactor. And so what happens is that a little bit of the meteoritic material during such a large-scale impact, usually the meteorite vaporizes completely. Nothing is left of the actual meteorite, and even if there would be anything left, it weathers and erodes away quite quickly on the Earth's surface. So the little bit of meteoritic material that is mixed in with the terrestrial rocks, a little bit like salt in, in a soup, uh, is something we can detect because there are some elements like the platinum group elements that includes iridium, osmium, and others that are much higher in abundance in, meteorit in most meteoritic materials than in terrestrial crustal rocks, which are the target rocks. So we can look at the abundances of some of those siderophile elements like iridium, osmium, uh, but also uh, others. And we can look at the inter-element ratios of these, maybe after correcting for the target rock composition. And then there are some isotopic compositions that are different between meteoritic materials and terrestrial crustal rocks. For example, in terms of osmium isotopic composition and chromium isotopic composition. So those are geochemical methods, how we can measure the presence of a meteorite component in impact-derived rocks. So 
of course, impact processes have been important in the solar system from the very beginning onwards. Collision, etc., the moon forming impact, etc. And um, there has been some talk, and I'll come back to that in a moment, about the possibility of a so-called late heavy bombardment centered around 3.9 uh, billion years ago on the moon and then by inference also on Earth. Now, the problem we are faced with is that uh, the age of the surface, basically, the current surfaces, if we look at uh, Mercury, Moon, or Mars, you see that the age of the surface is relatively old, and this is schematic, of course, somewhere from 4.5 to maybe 3 to uh, billion years old. The Moon maybe stopped mostly around 3 billion years. And on the Earth, we have mostly young rocks. And what kind of crust do we have on the Earth? Well, Mercury, the Moon, uh, and to some part Mars still has their primary crust, which was impact generated at the beginning of the formation of these planets. On Mars and Venus, there are secondary crust, partial melt from the Earth or Venus mantle. And then, of course, on Earth, we also have tertiary crust that is reworked of the primary and secondary crust. And this is a very, I think, interesting figure that shows us what the problem is when we look back into the past on Earth. Uh, this shows uh, the areas on Earth that are preserved of certain geological times. And you'll see that the most recent ones, the Meso and the Cenozoic, uh, this is the yellow areas. This is, of course, a current day tectonic map. Um, they are relatively young. The ocean floors, there's nothing that is older than about, say, 200 million years. Um, on the continents and on the cratons, only these orange areas, like in southern Africa, a little bit in northern Europe, in northern Canada, a small place uh, in, in Brazil, uh, and a little bit in Australia, those are Archean rocks, but of course, Archean rocks start already at uh, two point uh, something billion years ago. So those rocks that are really old and that would tell us something about what happened about 3.5 to 4 billion years ago on the Earth, you can measure basically in square kilometers. Um, there is the oldest part of the Earth's surface, which is the Acastagnice, which is just a few tens of kilometers that are um, square kilometers that are exposed. So we have a problem. The area we're looking at back in the past gets smaller and smaller. Of course, if we look at the current day distribution of impact structures, apart from this very large one here, Chicxulub in Mexico, which is the KT boundary impact structures, most of the larger impact craters and many of the others are concentrated in the old cratonic areas in North America, North Europe, Australia, and South Africa. And those are younger than uh, two billion years. So how would the Earth have looked like back in the early Archean? Now, on the right side we have present-day Earth, on the left side we have probably the early Earth. The green color has to do with the high amount of iron ions in the water at the time, and relatively small amounts of land, maybe only less than 30% of what the continental masses make up today were present around 3.5, 3.7 billion years ago. So preservation is a major problem. Plate tectonics started, there's a huge debate going on when it really started, we really don't know very well. Um, the crust formed not immediately, not all at once, but slowly with time. This is a diagram that shows you uh, the bars indicate zircon ages that indicate crustal formation. So it came kind of in pulses and started maybe around the major phase around three billion years ago, continental crustal formation, before we had mafic crust on the Earth. And you see the uh, various models, these lines that indicate that there were models before data were actually obtained. So the Taylor and McLennan model is probably the best one. Um, now, of course, we know that consequences for a large, of large impacts on the early Earth would have been severe. Um, and the early Earth, we know, was dominated by impacts. This may be this image here from Markey et al. exaggerates probably the amount of land mass that was present at the time. But we also shouldn't forget that oceans were dominating the surface of the Earth way back even beyond 4.2 billion years ago. 
Now, data from Apollo uh, rocks indicated already in the late 19, mid 1970s uh, that the moon probably was subjected to an intense post accretionary bombardment between about 4.45 and 3.9 billion years ago. And some of those data were interpreted to indicate a peak in the bombardment history at about 3.9 uh, billion years ago called the late heavy bombardment. Some people indicate that this is the end of a major bombardment phase. Others think there is a peak, so it's not really universally accepted. What we have here in this diagram on the right, was it a kind of just a, a, an exponentially falling uh, impact rate, or was there a peak? There's a variety of lines of evidence that I don't have time to go into here, except that uh, if you really take the ages of the lunar basins at face value as they have been proposed, and there is reason to doubt that this is true, then we ought to have the moon by normal accretion at about 4.1 billion years ago and not 4.5. And so that's a problem, obviously, which may indicate that there was a peak. On Earth, however, because of the lack of proper rocks, maybe, we have no unequivocal evidence of a late heavy bombardment. There's some indirect geochemical evidence for, of course, the large uh, moon-forming uh, impact event at about 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, and then there's a long gap of the rock record. And the first solid evidence, in the true sense of the word, are for impact processes are about 3.4 billion year old impact spheral layers in South Africa and Australia. And we have studied those over the last 20 something years in my group in Vienna and with colleagues around the world. And I should remind that the oldest preserved impact crater on Earth is about 2 billion years old. So, as I've said, very few rocks on Earth exist with ages of about 3.9 billion years. There is nothing beyond about 4 billion years, except a few zircon grains uh, from the Jack Hills in Australia that date up to about 4.4 billion years. Oxygen isotopic composition in these zircons indicates that there was actually liquid water present on the Earth's surface uh, during the Hadean times, so 4.2, 4. maybe even 4.3 billion years ago. And the Hadean Earth, of course, had a very thick basaltic crust, which was covered mostly by an ocean and very little dry land was present, and very few granitoids was present. So this might be an artistic impression of the Earth around 4.1 billion years ago. Uh, zircons, uh, these old zircons, of course, would be a possible record of any impact events on the early Earth, because zircons do preserve shock effects. And a variety of studies have been done in Isua, for example, by my group, uh, a long time ago, we didn't find anything. And more recently, uh, Cox and colleagues uh, from Australia searched for shocked zircons. 21,000 grains were studied. And uh, the baseline is they didn't look, they didn't find any convincing shock effects in any of those. But the only thing they had was a sample of 21,000 grains. They didn't know exactly the age. Those were Jack Hill zircons. They range in age probably from about 4.3 to probably 3.5 billion years old. Uh, and also, uh, it's just from one single location. So another problem is that a zircon thermometry, basically, uh, the um, amount of titanium that is present in zircon indicates the melting um, conditions. And they are higher in impact-derived rocks than in normal metamorphic uh, zircons, and so or, or magmatic zircons even. But none of these higher temperature zircons were found in a smaller study by Militsky and others published in EPSL in 2012. We looked for geochemical signatures in the Isua rocks. Uh, basically, if you don't have anything uh, of impact-derived material, you look at anything, because there are just very few rocks present of that age. And the results were that we really didn't find anything convincing back then either. But, interestingly enough, the iridium abundance has reached a few hundred parts per trillion, which is relatively high for continental crust, but the abundance ratios don't match a meteoritic component. Then there was a publication in 2002 by Schoenberg and others, tungsten isotopic composition in some of these Isua rocks from Greenland that are about 3.8 billion years old, supposedly indicated the presence of a meteoritic component. However, it was immediately difficult to understand why that would be the case, because tungsten is not an element that is particularly enriched in meteorites, and therefore you would basically have to have uh, 80 or 90% of the tungsten coming from meteorites, 
And you would see that very clearly in the platinum group element abundances, and we don't. And of course, these people never did a proper study of impact-derived rocks, uh, younger impact-derived rocks, to see if there is any tungsten isotopic composition anomaly present. And we did that study a few years later, and the answer is there is nothing that you can detect in normal impact-derived rocks. So uh, <clears throat> even if uh, several percent level abundances of extraterrestrial material would be present, tungsten isotopic uh, isotopes compositions show no measurable effect in the isotopic anomaly. And there was another quote uh, from another paper in Nature that basically said they didn't find anything in these rocks either, and they suggest that this earlier paper probably was suffering from analytical artifacts, making things a little bit difficult. Now, uh, we don't know when life started on Earth, really. You know, we have indications of about 3.5, 3.6, 3, maybe 3.8 billion years ago. Could have been there a little earlier. What was life? What type of life? We don't know either. But uh, the late heavy bombardment could have been um, influential in this respect. And uh, we know, however, that even imbrium sized impactors would only have 1% of the energy required to evaporate the whole Earth ocean. So the effects would have probably been less than we originally indicated. Now, uh, coming back to these uh, early Archean impacts, here is uh, a sample of these feral beds. They are found in various locations, South Africa and in Australia, uh, and they are the real first rock record about 500 million years after the end of the proposed late heavy bombardment. This is the Barberton Greenstone Belt in South Africa. This is a geological map, very complicated. I really don't have much time to go into but the samples that we've been studying come mainly from these two locations. Recently, we've studied others from mines as well. This is how spherules look like under the microscope. And the main point I want to make here is that all the material in these spherules is replaced. Nothing is original anymore. So even if the rock was laid down 3.4 billion years ago, the minerals have been changing since then. They have metamorphosed. They have been replaced. They've undergone... Uh, a lot of alteration. The earliest impact craters on Earth that we know of are Vredefort in South Africa, 2.02 uh, billion years ago, and 1.85 billion years ago, Sudbury in Canada. The spheral layers and also some of the earlier uh, impact deposits have uh, shown clear chromium and um, Osmium isotopic abundances, I don't have time to go into the details here, but it's even possible to tell that these early Archean impact layers had had a carbonaceous chondritic composition from the impact that we found some remnants of platinum group element nuggets that are typically meteoritic within nickel chromium spinel within these spherules. So this is maybe the only thing that is left over from the early impacts. Osmium isotopic composition I already mentioned. And to come to the end here, we really don't have any definitive criteria for the identification of Archean impact deposits. We have not found any of the source craters, and it's unlikely that we'll ever find them because uh, the rocks on which they were uh, formed have long gone. Here's Radeford in South Africa, what is left of it after 10 kilometers of erosion. And uh, basically, the study of these spheral layers helps us understand what was going on in the early Earth, but only back to a little less than 3.5 billion years ago. And about half of the impact record on Earth is not doc documented by, uh, time-wise, is not documented by any uh, impact by any geological evidence. Um, I just threw that slide in at the end here. What happens maybe on exoplanets? There is some indication of a light heavy bombardment that was published on uh, on on uh, Eta Corvi uh, about a billion years after the formation of the system. Interesting indication. Uh, and cometary impacts have been reported also from uh, young systems, possible cometary impacts, but I would like to remind everybody also that today comets do not dominate the impact flux on Earth. Asteroids do by far. So to conclude, basically, there's lots of open questions about the impact record on early Earth. The only thing we know for sure, it had a very important influence on the evolution of the early Earth. Thank you.